again, blessed to be here with you and blessed and honored that Mark and Shirley would entrust the evening to me again after uh, my first time uh, stumbling and fumbling through. We made it, and uh, I watched it back. Actually, they recorded, and I watched it back, and I thought, well, it wasn't that bad. So hopefully tonight we can do a little bit better because we always try to improve in the Lord, right? That's the whole idea. So let's pray, and we'll get started as to what the Lord has for this evening for us. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, Lord, humbly. We ask, Lord, that you guide and direct our every thought, every word. Lord, that you would be exalted, that you would be lifted up, Lord. That we would just get another little glimpse into who you are and what you do for us every single day. God, let your word speak to us. Let our hearts be tender and receiving. Lord, let us rejoice in the fact that you care for us and love us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. And not only that, but so that we might live through him and in him. God, we bless you. We thank you. Lord, those that are here this evening, we ask, Lord, a special blessing upon them for those at home who are watching a blessing upon them, Lord, and Lord, that uh, that those that are still traveling here, that you'll get them here safe and sound, Lord, and that we'll have a good time in you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was asked about this, I was, I was tracking with Pastor Mark on the abundance and... Um, on what that meant, and I've never been really um, what they might call a word faith person. Um, never really looked too much into it. Never really dwelled upon the things of the world that much. And my, as far as um, the the wealth and and all of that, um, I certainly believe in it. I, I've always believed that God needs men like Barnabas. Barnabas, who would sell everything and give it to the church so the church can move forward, so that the church can do what it's supposed to do. It takes finance. Paul didn't travel the world and the known world back then. He didn't travel it, you know, on a thin dime. God always provided something. It wasn't always in a certain form, which we're kind of used to, but God always, always makes a way. So maybe you're here this evening, and you think God didn't really bless you today. Maybe he hasn't blessed you all week. In your mind, you just, you know, you're just kind of going through life every day, same old thing, same old stuff. The kingdom living isn't for you. The kingdom life isn't for you. That's where a lot of people are, people in the church, right? We're not, we're a hospital. There's a lot of folks who are not doing well. Well, I just ask you to take a breath. Just <sighs> take a breath. Did you think about that breath when you took it? Yeah, you did, didn't you? Because I said, take a breath. You thought about it. Now, are you still thinking about taking a breath? No. No. You went through the whole entire day without thinking about breathing, didn't you? I mean, you probably never even thought about it until I mentioned it. All day long you spent, maybe the whole week, you spent thinking about breathing. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You know, it says in the Word that God breathed into you the breath of life. And somehow we think that that was just in the garden. That's the only place that he breath, breathed into us, right? But that is so far from the truth of it. He continues to breathe into us every moment of our life. That in and of itself is the best blessing, you know, because that is his life in me. He takes care of the breathing so I can carry on and do the things that he's having me breathe to do. 
Acts 17 and 25. Acts 17 and 25. He says, He gives to all life and breath, and then he puts in there, and all things. And all things. He gives us life and breath and all things. Acts 17 and 28. It says, In him we live and move and have our being. What does that mean, have our being? Well, it's our life. It's who we are. It's who he created us to be. That's what having our being is. Maybe today was like any other day for you. You've been living on a half-empty life. Way back years ago, when we started in ministry, Ministry 101, it's just as easy to keep the top half full. You know what I mean by that? How many of you run into the gas station and get two bucks worth of gas? Or you get, you're, you're down to where you got like, you're on fumes, and you fill it up halfway, right? That's how a lot of lives are. They're filled up halfway, right? You have a half full life. Or in most cases, it's a half-empty life because you think about things in the negative. And I shouldn't be saying you, I should be saying we, because we all do it. We have a half-empty life. Back in the day, and ever since I heard that in, in one of the classes we had, if my car is half-empty, it's empty. My wife brings that car home half empty, she's going out and filling it up. That's the way your life should be. You shouldn't be content with half empty. You can fill the top half just as easy as filling the bottom half, which is where most of us live. I know we did for years and years, and even still now on occasion. We can't afford to fill the tank. But I can't afford to have an empty tank. Because if God says, get up and go, I better be ready as a minister to get up and go. No excuses. You know, half empty is empty. But half full is empty too. Right? So no matter how you want to phrase it. You know, it says in the scripture... Romans 15, 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And, get this, believing. Believing. Keep that in your head tonight. We're going to be talking a little bit about that. So that you may abound in hope. Right? Hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 15, and 13. That was my preamble. That's not my message tonight. But that was just my starter because I knew people would be coming in, you know, as we got going. So that was just a little bit of a, uh, oh, I don't know, throw it out there, see if it sticks on the wall. And see if maybe you were blessing it, but, you know. Matthew 6 and 31, I think right through 34 says this. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. 33 says this, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, 
For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Strange way to put that, right? If we're always concerned and fretting about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, how we're going to get clothed, all of that, he says, hey, that's it. It stops here today. That's, you don't need anything else for today. Don't take, th you, I mean, you're in it today. Don't worry about it for tomorrow because today is the day. The funny thing about this is that he, he repeats this. You know, out of the, the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. That's the scripture. But Luke says pretty much the same thing. He says in 12, 29, 32, seek not what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Neither be of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. You know, Matthew said the Gentiles. Because, I mean, the, the Jewish nation was a nation set apart unto God. And all the other nations were considered Gentile, right? But now he's telling us. I'm talking about all the other nations. That's what they do. They seek after these things. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? right? And your father knows that you have need of these things. But rather, it says again, seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. These things added to you. What things? We just said them. Food, water, fig leaves. Don't be a doubtful mind. The Gentiles, the nations, they think that way. Have faith. Faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You hope you'll get to eat today. You hope you'll get to drink today. You hope that those fig leaves are actually going to turn into skins that you can wear because fig leaves don't work, <laughs> if you recall. We are not of this world. And our Father knows we have need of these things. Fear not, little sheep. Fear not, little lambs, little flock. For our Father delights, he is glad, and he is pleased to give you the kingdom. So how does all that add up? Well, the kingdom, first off, in Luke 17 and 20, 21, and this is Jesus, he's get, he gets challenged. He says, well, where's this kingdom? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the leaders of the world, uh, or of, of Jewry, in that day they were saying, well, where is this kingdom? How is this kingdom? What, what, what about this kingdom? And Jesus said, the kingdom does not come by observation. Nor will they say, see here, here it is. No. Oh, oh, see there, there it is. For indeed, the kingdom of God is where? Within you. That's where it's at. So if that kingdom is within you, what did we just read? Don't fret about what you're going to eat. Don't fret what you're going to drink. Don't fret how you're going to be clothed. Don't worry about anything because our Father, as I read earlier, gives us all things. He gives us that breath, right? He gives us life, and he gives us all things, all things. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus would say, is like a mustard seed. When a man took and planted this in his field, though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds come and perch in its branches. One other thing I was going to mention, too, is that if you have a, a cob of corn, right, that cob of corn, right, you, you plant a seed, you get a, a, a corn stalk, 
And I think you get, what, three, four, five cobs off of each one? And a uh, little fun fact, one cob of corn has 16 rows and about 800 seeds in total within those rows. So now if you think about that, you got one corn on the cob, and God says, plant that seed. You have 800 seeds to plant in 16 rows. Each one of those seeds has potential to grow a corn stalk that'll have up to maybe four, five, six head? I don't know. I can't, you know, I can't remember. I mean, I grew up on a farm, but we grew grains. We didn't grow corn. But I, I remember going through cornfields and uh, corn maize, right? You go to the corn maize and you see one stalk with the potential of having five heads of 800. Think about that. That's multiplication, right? I mean, it's in nature. It's in nature. And we are, we are greater than nature. We are greater than nature. So that, that's a law of multiplication. And you do the math on it. Wow. Wow. 800 plants in 16 rows from one cob of corn. Now, some of you are content to open up that corn and, like, have half of it. Uh, that's my lot in life. No, that's not God's plan for your life. It's not. It's a, the kingdom of God, he likens it to things, right? He says, plant, you know, and expect the harvest. Plant the seed, expect the harvest. Now, Matthew um, emphasized the kingdom's unpromising beginnings when he wrote about this kingdom of heaven being a mustard seed. It's so small. But as we know, small faith. Jesus said, if you have faith of a mustard seed, if you have that faith, you'll say unto this mountain, right? But he says there was a unpromising beginnings in this. The kingdom would eventually grow into a tree that could accommodate all the birds of the world, but it would start from a small, inconsequential seed. You know, maybe sometimes when you're putting your might in the bag, right? It's your last dollar. You might think that that's nothing. But if it's all you have, it becomes everything. And to God, the greater blessing. You know, we've been talking a bit about tithe. The tithe really isn't yours. You don't get blessed by the tithe. The tithe, all that's it really by doing your tithe and giving your tithe back to God, all it does is rebuke the devourer. That's it. You know, and God says, you can test me in that. But where the real blessing comes is going over and above benevolence, you know, making sure that the, the Lord's house, the Lord's people don't go without. That's where the real blessing is. I have a, a gentleman, he was in Teen Challenge for quite a few years, and he, uh, he came to my Sunday school classes, and we used to talk a lot about giving and tithing and missions and, and that. And I always believe that if you're giving to missions, God will bless that. He will bless you in that. But he, he sent me a text about maybe a year ago, and he said, Brother Mollard says, you know, we're still giving to our missions. We haven't stopped, never stopped. We continue to give through thick and thin. In the, in the, in the lean years, and the fat years, we continue to give. And it's all because of the teaching you did on that. And he says, God has continually blessed us. We've never gone without. He says, we maybe not have been able to do everything we've aspired to do, but we've never gone without. That's the kind of God that I want you to see here this evening. Romans 14 and 17, really clear. The kingdom of God is not meat, drink, but righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. So what's the problem? Why... Why do we have our doubt? 
our fear, our unbelief. And should that unbelief of mine hinder another from being blessed by God? Like, do we look around and see, oh, wow, look at what they're driving. Look what they're living in. Look how they're dressed. Look what they have on their hands. Look what they have in their ears. Are you really, do you want the observation? Do you want the kingdom to come by observation? I personally don't. I don't, personally, I don't care what another has. What I'd like to see is what another does with it. And then I don't have to answer for that. Should we be glorifying God for the goodness that he shows to all of us? Absolutely. Now here in this, we can either be a prodigal son Right? Or we can be his brother. And I think some of you may know what I mean by that. Right? So you can either get it from God and squander it and then come back to the Father and he's going to do what? He's going to give you more. Or you can be the brother who just, I'm doing it because i got to do it. I don't really want to be here. I'm so glad you're here tonight, and I don't want to beat up on the Wednesday night people. My wife already said, you better not, because you are the faithful. You at home, I wish you were here, but I understand you might not be able to be. But at least you're online. So you can be the prodigal, and you can get from God and squander it. And I'll tell you, I know this to be true, because my wife will tell you, I have put us into debt not once, not twice, not three times, but four times in our 50 years of marriage. Okay, true confessions. And I'm not ashamed to say it, because in it all, since I came to the Lord, He has always, always, always been there to bail me out. Some way, somehow, miraculously. Now, do I, do I, it's like an addiction, right? It is. It is like an addiction. But God is faithful. So we can either be a prodigal or we can be his brother. And I prefer to be the prodigal and continue to fail and let God lift me back up. That's what I want to see. That's what I I don't want to be there when it's happening, but I understand that God is going to go ahead and lift me up. Romans says this, Romans 3, for what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Certainly not. Indeed, let God be found true and every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Now, that's not talking about me or what I just said. Oh, Romans 3.3. 3. That's not talking about me or what I just said. That's not, I'm not the you here. Do you know who the you is here in this? When he's referring to, he's talking about God. Let God be justified in his words, and let your, God's word, overcome when you, God, are judged. Because isn't that what we do? We don't judge our brother. We judge God when we are looking at others and what God has done for them. Let's take a look at the unpromising beginnings in the garden. That's where I want to go tonight. I want to go back to the garden. As Genesis' story unfolds, it appears unlikely to prove worthwhile or result favorably for the man or the woman. But God is there. God is in the midst of the garden. Y'all know the stories, I'm sure. Genesis 1, the history of creation. Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion, subdue, or rule over. Let them have dominion over the fish 
of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created them, male and female. Oh, boy. Are we hearing a lot about that today? Oh, is God true? Or is the world true? Right? You, you might be born a man, and you might die a woman, but when they dig up your bones, you're going to be a man. That's all there is to it. And no matter how you want to spin that or believe it, it's the only truth because it's God's truth. He made us male and female. He created them, period. Enough said. 28, then God blessed them. Wow. We're in the garden here, right? And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it, rule over it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Verse 29, and God said, see, I have given, I want to repeat it, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth. Every, every, every tree whose fruit yields seed that you, in, or to you it shall be for food. Think not of what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, Right? Verse 31, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. There was evening, and there was morning, and this is on the sixth day. You all know what he did on the seventh. But did you know at the end of day three, day four, day five, and even before he said it's very good, God saw everything that he was doing in creation and said, it is good. And then he gets to where he has created man. And at the end of that chapter, he says, and I looked upon it all and saw that it was very, very good. Very good. So how did this life in the garden go? You know, because he created a garden. And it says that there was no man in that garden to till the ground. I actually either forgot that Adam wasn't actually created in the garden. The, he finished his work on the day he rested. He probably looked and thought, whoa, I need someone to tend this thing. You know, hindsight, right? He's looking into the garden now and he's saying, oh, yeah, everything's in there, but who's going to take care of it? Because I'm not going to garden this thing, even though Jesus said my dad's a, my dad's a husbandman, right? He's, he's, a, he's taking care of the vines, right? And I'm the vine. That's what Jesus said. I, I'm the vine. My father is the husbandman, right? But he's looking at this garden saying, well, I'm not going to tend it. I'm not going to take care of it. But he created the man outside the garden. And then all of a sudden he's saying, oh, there's no man in the garden there to till the ground. And we always thought that Adam was there just to enjoy it, right? Just to kind of chill out, go do a little surfing, you know, pick a few plums off the tree and just sit back and, you know, all on his own because the woman's not here yet. It says that he named all the animals. He named all the insects. He named everything that God created. He named it. He was a busy guy, but he wasn't in the garden yet, right? I mean, that's what it says. So Genesis 2 and 8, he says, The Lord God planted a garden 
eastward in Eden, and there put the man whom he had formed. He says that he, he planted the garden eastward of Eden, right? We call it the Garden of Eden, but it's eastward of Eden, so we have no idea really where that is. That's out there somewhere. And there he put the man. He planted the man in the garden, basically, right? God put the man in the garden eastward of Eden to till the ground, to tend the garden, Rick. Yeah, Rick told us, uh, he got in the truck today and he said, I was out tending my garden. I thought, you were out doing what? Tending your garden. Oh, well, that's interesting. Kind of uh, affirmative as we start at the head here tonight for church. Affirmation, right? We all like it. A little pat on the back from God. He was created outside the garden. God began to meet his need, right? He put him in the garden and he just left him there. No, he had work to do, and he had to work for what he did. But tending the garden is not the same as you'll see as toiling, which is the curse. Genesis 2 and 9 says this, Out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Have you taken time to look at trees when they're in blossom? You ever been to Washington, D.C., when the cherry blossoms are out in the swamp area along the river? Fantastic. Amazing. Have you ever gone up into British Columbia? There's a place up there called Bouchard Gardens. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Trees and bloom. Plants, flowers, everything. It's beautiful. If there's a Garden of Eden in Canada, it's the Bouchard Garden. So if you ever go up there, check it out. But it's pleasant to the sight. And guess what? It's good for food. Now, how many times have I mentioned food tonight? Right? In the last days, they'll be doing what? Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Oh, it's a party time. Do you think we're there yet? A restaurant on every corner, a bar on the other side? Yeah. God repeats this again. The whole thing that he did in chapter uh, 2, he repeats it again twice. I already said out of the mouth of two or three witnesses is a thing established. If God says it twice, you better pay attention. That's what you better do. Pay attention. This is important. That's the way the Jews see it. And guess what? We are Jews. We are spiritual Jews. We have crossed over from life or from death unto life. We move from death unto life. God repeats it. Genesis 2.15, he says this. Then the, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden east of Eden to tend and keep it. He had work to do. You have work to do. Right? We have work to do. That's why we're here. Are we here just to fill a pew? Fill a chair? Keep it warm? No, of course not. God doesn't expect you to do that. And hopefully you don't expect you to do that either. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely, what? Eat. There's the word again right? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. In that day that you eat it, you shall surely die. And that is something Jesus came to get us out of. Death. He has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. That's the word of the Lord to Abraham and all of us, every one of us, now has become a curse. It's a curse. Adam, he said in Genesis 3.17, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, 
Now, some of you are single, so you don't have to deal with that. <laughs> but you get the drift, right? You get the drift. Maybe it was your mom back in the day. My mom would always say, that boy is not good for you. You don't want to be hanging around with that guy. I should have listened to my mom a little bit more. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, now whose voice should he have been listening to? And have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you will not eat of it. Right? Here it comes, the curse. Cursed is the ground for your sake. What? Back that up again. Repeat it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. You see, every time we are not obedient to God, there's a consequence. Every single time. If we don't do thus saith the Lord, there's a consequence. Now, the consequence can be something that will stick with you the rest of your life. God comes and delivers you out of your past, out of yourself. But you know what? He leaves what we said and used to call in Teen Challenge, marks of ownership. You know, I had a, I have, I had, I still have, he's still alive. Uh, it's a wonder because he was part of the Banditos in San Antonio for years. And he is covered in tattoos, tats everywhere. You know, the bare-breasted women and all the rest, the, the crosses and the, the stuff on the neck and all those gang signs, everything. And um, he came to the Lord. He's been with the Lord now as long as I have, I think pretty close to 50 years as well. And uh, he, uh, you know, he, he looks at those things and he goes, wow, you know, in his old age, he's saying, wow, look, look, look where I was, David, look where I was. And look where I am today. He says, I'd be dead. I'd be in the grave. I'd be in hell now if, if God hadn't plucked me out and put me where I needed to be. You know, he, he wasn't one of the guys that ever went through Teen Challenge. But he could have. He could have been. But he didn't. God had another plan. And it's called he got into church and he sought after God. If the doors were open, he was there. If we had prayer night, he was there. <clears throat> the only time he was not was when he was working. Ah, what shall we drink? Ah, and slobber. Curse is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of your face shall be, uh, in, the, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. For your sake, the ground is cursed, not so that you'll get better by taking care and doing the work. You know, that's the other thing that we got to be very careful about, is that you cannot work your way into heaven. It's by faith and by the grace of God, period. But when he says, you know, that little scripture where it says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, right? Baptize them, make disciples. I'll be with you there all the way. So where has God planted you? Right? Where has God planted you? And this is, uh, this is interesting. I, I, th this came to me. Vaughn, on Sunday morning, prophesied during worship. And he said, bloom where you are planted. Bloom where you are planted. Bloom where you are planted. Where are you planted? Where are you planted? What are you doing 
in your garden, right? What am I doing in my garden? Are you looking at my garden? See how much better my garden is? You like my weeds? You can have my weeds. <laughs> Bobby cutting the grass all the time, right? Always working. Am I looking at your garden? Do I see your garden? And oh, well, look, what, look what's blooming over there, boy. You know, the only garden that I'm really wanting to get is the grass. Well, yeah, that too. But the grass that's in the Marathon Motel little garden area there that Danny built, that grass in there, that grass is delightful. Best grass I've ever seen. And it's in the desert, folks. You guys got married there. Yeah, that was such a sweet time. Yeah, I mean... That grass is just incredible. If you're ever in Marathon and haven't seen that grass, pop in and have a look. It'll blow you away. Unbelievable. In the desert. Yeah, a little bit of water in the right, the right seed, right? Whose voice are you listening to? Well, you're listening to mine right now because I'm the loudest person in here. But hopefully... The Spirit's speaking to you, too. That's what I'm hoping for. Because if all I'm up here doing is a rant, then, you know, that ain't going to get nowhere. But if the Spirit's actually speaking into your life, that's what we want. Whose voice are you listening to? You know, His commandments to Adam and Eve, and it's to Eve indirectly, right? Eve had not yet been uh, in the garden when Adam was there, right? He... She's the one that was created in the garden, right? But Adam was created out of the garden, put in the garden, and then God caused sleep to come upon him, and from his side he took a rib and formed a woman, right? And, he, and she was to be what? A helpmate. That's what it says, right? So, and from his side, you know, not from his feet. I like this. You've heard it, right? So that we can stand on her. And uh, that sort of thing. But we don't want to get it down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but he created the woman, right? Now, the woman didn't get that commandment from God. But she knew about it. She didn't get it directly from God that we know of. It's not written in the book, right? It's not written in the book. But Adam probably let her know, hey, you know, that tree there, that tree we're not supposed to touch. But we, hey, look at there, that, that tree over there, that one. That one we can touch. And all these others we can, and all those ones that are pleasant to the eye, we can touch all of those. But that one there we can't. We'll get more to that in a minute. But his commandments are to them, be fruitful and multiply. This is, again, he repeats it after he creates the woman, right? Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. Over the fish of the sea, dominion over the fit. The birds of the air have dominion uh, over li every living thing that moves on the earth. Of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you will not touch it. And that's where we end. That's where it ends, right there. Because the next thing you know, they're on their way out of the garden. They're on their way out of the garden. What's the very next thing that we see? They're out of the garden, and we have the murder of Cain, or the murder of Abel by Cain, Genesis 4. We really don't hear anything after the first verse of the chapter about Adam and Eve again. A little bit in Hebrews, but outside of that, we, we don't hear nothing on them, nothing. The first name offspring of Adam and Eve are Cain and Abel. They're born firstborn outside the garden after they've been kicked out. Presumably, and this is what everybody seems to think, is that Adam and Eve didn't really, you know, have time in the garden. They were busy tending it to have offspring in the garden. But you got to ask yourself, where did all the people come from? Because Cain gets banished. And there's a whole world out there that God says to 
You touch him and kill him, his blood's on you. Yeah, read it. So apparently they didn't have time to be fruitful and multiply like they were commanded. Now, do you believe that? Because I, I don't. I believe that they had children in the garden. We have no idea how long they were there. We, we assume that, you know, he makes the woman and the next day, oh, she's having from the tree. That's not how it works. It's like the upper room. The Holy Spirit falls in the upper room, you know, lights down on them like tongues of fire upon their head, and all, the whole room becomes crazy, and it's noised abroad, and they go from there somewhere, because you're not going to get 3,000 people up into the upper room. They had what? How many did they have up there? 250? It's a sizable room. But you're not going to get 3,000. And that's how many came to the Lord the first day, the day of Pentecost. That's how many made a decision for Christ that day based on repent, be baptized, every one of you, for what? The remission of sins. Oh, no so that you can have an outward expression of an inward work. Come on, give me a break. No, for repentance and for forgiveness of sin, right? Remission of sin. That's why we do it. That's why we're obedient. That's why it's important. You're not going to get 3,000 people in an upper room. And the things that happened in the garden... We're over years and years. We have no idea how long. No idea. But we do know this. Right? Everything that they had there, God gave them. And he allowed them to make of it the best they could by tending it. You know, a lot of us, we come to the Lord. I mean, don't take this wrong, but read your Bible. Read it. You're blessed to have it. We've only had it since 1611. You know, before that, you had to rely on someone telling you what it said. Why do you think we have what we have today? We have an established mainline church, churches, that are still just telling the people what they need to believe. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. God gives us everything we need, and you have to seek after it. You have to search it out for yourselves. You need to be that Berean. You know, Paul preached the word to them, but they said, hey, we ain't going to buy into this. We're going to search the scripture and see if he's saying what, he, what he's saying is the truth about God. And you can do that with mine too, tonight. And you're being very, very honorable, and I appreciate it. Let me tell you this, the curse on Eve would indicate that they had children in the garden. They were blessed in the garden. They had the laughter and the fun of children, which today they want to destroy any which way they can, in the womb or out of the womb. And it's a disgrace that the church doesn't stand up and speak to it. That's why I'm speaking to it tonight. It's a disgrace. They had children while in the garden. You, can, you, can, you can't find it in the scripture, but you just know God. You know God. You read through the scripture from Genesis to maps, and you know God. And that's the whole thing about reading the, the word. And knowing God. It's line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little bit, there a little bit. Pastor Mark says something. Shirley gets up, says something. They go together. Vaughn prophesies from the, from the worship service. You put it all together. The Holy Spirit falls, binds it upon our hearts. That's what happened. Curse upon the woman, right? He told them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Multiply it. What? 
I'm going to multiply your conception? To me, that means like more kids. More kids. You're going to have more kids. What's the count now? How many? What's, what's the most kids one woman has ever produced? Did anybody know? Man, it's crazy, right? Yeah. So, quite a few, some. I mean, my dad came up, a family of 14. 14. He was the youngest. He, he actually was raised by his grandmother. You know, back in those days, the parents, they just didn't have the wherewithal to raise all these kids. Right? And as Pastor said the other day, your children, your progeny, were your security. It wasn't going to be found in a wallet, in a card from the government saying, you know, you get this, this much money to spend every month in your old age. No, your kids were, you know. And if there's anything to, to really honor the Hispanic community is that they honor their kids. They honor their kids. All my Hispanic friends in San Antonio, which is mostly everybody in my church, love their kids do anything in the world for their kids, raise their kids. Everything's about their kids. The more, the merrier. Bring them on in. Multiply the kingdom. One of the things in Canada, we got, what, like a 0.5 child per family or something like that up there now. 0.5. Boy, that's going to propagate the world, isn't it? Not likely. I don't know about the U.S., I think it's maybe 1.5 or something. But Canada, 0.5. You know why? Because we got enough, nothing but homosexuality up in Canada. All we got up there. They've been doing it for years. Years. In pain you shall bring forth children. In pain now you're going to bring forth children. That sounds like a pretty good deal in the garden, doesn't it, ladies? I know my wife would much rather have had our children in the garden without the pain. Right? And greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. That's, I, I'm not sure about that word sorrow, but I, I know that, that uh, as a nurse, uh, and my wife, she was pe uh, I was pediatric. She was uh, uh, labor and delivery. But... Women, when they, when they birth a child, it's a part of them that, that's leaving their body. And it, it's like this it's like this detachment kind of syndrome or something. I don't know. You know more about it than I do. But, I mean, there's this, this thing. And, and some women don't get over that. And that's why some women have been known to kill their, their child. You know, that, that's happened too. But it's very rare, thank God. But, again, it's the sin nature in man, right? Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, that's a whole other message, just like a lot of what I've said tonight. You can get messages out of here. We don't have time for it. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Genesis 4, 2 through 5. It says that Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, again, how long is that? process of time? I have no idea. Do you have any idea? I don't even know what time it is now. I'm afraid to look because I want to get through this message. This, this teaching, hopefully it's a teaching and not a message. The process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Whoa! -ho! That should right there send off a little chime in your head. Abel also brought forth the firstborn of his flock, and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, isn't that just like us, in a way? God does something to chastise us and we're like my countenance has fallen and I hate you right now God why are you letting me go through this why is this happening to me you know you grit your teeth you hold your fist up in the air to God 
But let me, let me tell you, he brought an offering from the ground. What's wrong with the ground, folks? It's cursed. He brought a curse to the Lord is what he did. He brought a curse to the Lord. In doing so, not only did he disobey God, because God enacted animal sacrifice in the garden when he slew the animals and created clothing of skin for them. Now, I've had arguments about this with a lot of different people. Oh, no, God didn't, uh, God didn't kill the animals in the garden. He, that would be cruel. He'd be so cruel to do that. And it's like, um, yes, he did kill the animals in the garden. And it's very clear throughout the scripture that someone had to die for me because of my sin. And it wasn't going to be me if I said yes to the one who did. So I am free to live my life, not afraid of death, not afraid of God, not afraid of dying. I am free. Did I just do the Kamala thing and repeat the same word over and over again? No, anyway. So, yeah, sorry about that. Um, but, you know, the ground was cursed and he knew better. He knew better, but he thought like his dad. When Eve took of the, of the fruit and ate it and God asked her, well, who told you all this, right? And she says, well, the serpent told me. And then Adam, uh, why did you do it? Well, uh, she gave it to me and I did eat. You know, I think in the back of his head, he was thinking, well, God's not going to do anything to me for doing it if she gave it to me. You know, we start making up God's commands the way we want to have them, the way we want to receive them. It don't work, folks. It doesn't work. The ground is cursed. And if you bring an offering of the ground to God, what would you expect them to do? Abel's offering was accepted because it cost something their life. You're accepted to God because Jesus gave his life for you. Yes, I know, five minutes. What am I doing in my garden? If you are in Christ, he has returned you to the garden east of Eden spiritually. Did you hear that? Spiritually, he has. If you've come to Christ and you now live in, in Christ, you have been returned to the garden spiritually. God now provides for you every tree, the fruit thereof, spiritual tree, Natural tree, whatever kind of tree, everything in the world belongs to him. And he says, I will give it to you as you need it. He does. He says that. Well, what do we do? What we put, we put our trust in the thing that has the Benjamin on it, right? That's what we put our trust in, the green back with the Benjamin on it. You know, if, well, if, if there's no dollars in it, then, of course, that, can, that's, that can't be of God. You know, because that's how God does it today. Oh, really? Well, from what I hear on the news, we're moving into a realm of a cashless society or something to that effect, a digital society where um, if we get there, we won't have any control. Whoever controls the buttons controls the funds. So what economy? Do you, do you want to live in America's economy or do you want to live in a God's economy? I mean, that's... That's your choice, your choice. So are you going to toil in your garden? Or are you going to tend it, right? Do we work extremely hard and incessantly in the curse? Or do we apply ourselves to the care of and the watch over the blessings that we now possess? Does not the scripture tell us that we are to take care of what we have, be good stewards of what we have, and if we are, God will add to it. That's what the scripture says. But if you want to squander it away and give it away to things that you shouldn't be giving it to, which 
Nowadays, I'm finding out a whole lot about things, boy, that I supported over the years, that I'm kind of like, whoa, I don't think God was very pleased in that. And I'm not talking about giving to missions and things of that nature. Uh, I mean, no, 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 no. I'm talking about um, the things I've watched on TV, the things I've supported in our communities, those sort of things. Do we work extremely hard with the curse, or do we just roll with the tending? We tending, tending the garden. The tree of the knowledge of goodness, evil is still there. And you know what? A lot of us keep reaching up to it all the time because it's pleasant to the eye. Remember, sin for a season is pleasurable. But boy, when that hammer drops, it is no longer pleasant. No longer pleasant. I have so many stories I could share with you in so little time. It is, after all, a good food and pleasant to the eye. That's what it says. The curse remains. We toil in our soil naked, sewing together fig leaf garments. You won't accept the sacrifice that Jesus gave, so you're going to put together your own salvation. But that doesn't work. It won't work with God. It won't work. We hear the voice of God. We are afraid. We hide. Our countenance falls. Sin lies at the door. We should be tending our garden. And he put us back in the garden to tend it. We should be fruitful and multiply. We should be filling the earth. We should be subduing it. We should be having dominion. We should tend and take from the tree in the midst of the garden. What tree is that? The tree of life, Jesus. He's there. He was there from the beginning of the world. Before the beginning of the world is what the scripture says. If you abide in me, my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so shall you be my disciples. Whose voice are you listening to? Are you listening to the serpent in the garden? Has God not said? Oh, I can hear that subtle voice and like the, the, the way in which he says it. And it's like seductive. Has God not said? And the woman says, oh, yeah, God did did say, he said, we not to touch that. Oh, he didn't mean it. And so now you have a choice. You can toil or you can tend. I suggest you tend. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Will not God continue to pour out his favor upon your life? Of course he will. Why wouldn't he? In all honesty, in the 50 years that I've been married, it hasn't been easy. We've had some rough times, rough times, but we stuck it out. And the reason why we stuck it out is because the binding that we have is threefold. Jesus, Darlene, and me. And it says a threefold cord can't be broken. You know, he's picked us up and moved us around the world, around the country for sure. Um, but through it all, he has been 100% faithful in my unfaithfulness. He has been 100% reliable in my doubt and in my fear. He has always provided every which way you can imagine, miraculously. I told Pastor Mark the other day that um, we had just cleared up taxes for 2020, and and we were um, and and um, I had just paid that last thousand dollars, and I looked at my checkbook and I still had a thousand dollars there, and I was like, oh. <laughs> where did this come from? I could not find it. To this day, I can't find it. I don't know where it came from, but it was there. So I, I paid that last thousand. 
I had a thousand left over. I was going to surprise her for our anniversary because we don't have a stove yet and I need to get a stove. Um, so it's about a thousand dollars for that stove. And so I was going to go out and I was going to buy a stove when I was in San Antonio. Well, what happened was this happened. And so my trip to San Antonio chewed up not only the thousand dollars that I had, but it also cost me $1,450 in tires on my car because I had a blowout on the way there. And uh, by the time I went in to get all the tires, it was like, you know, these tires aren't going to last too much longer. And I got to thinking, I had a blowout. I'm pretty sure I don't want to have another blowout in the middle of nowhere because uh, we were six miles. I was six miles short of Brackettville, and I had that blowout. But God gave me. I had that $1,000 to make the trip first off, and it cost me that. It cost me close to $300 for gas. So that plus everything else that I had to get when I was there, the tires, everything else, and I still came back, still had the money, and I still have a balance in my bank book, which is not much. Don't look at me and say, oh, we've got thousands. No, no, we live paycheck to paycheck. We do, yeah. But God is always faithful. And it's always there. And he's never let me down. And he won't let you down either. What lets you down is that you toil instead of tend. You toil instead of tend. All he wants you to do is be faithful in what he has your hand to do. And he says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Get into your Bible. Become faithful to the assembly within the church. Don't forsake assembling of yourselves together. Be here. You're the only person that can meet someone sometimes. You're the person that God's put here for that person who's come in the door who needs help. You're the one, not me. I mean, yeah, I'm here, but... God has that person for me too. But if you're not here, who meets that need? Or does it get met at all? Get into the word. Fill yourself up. Be full of the spirit of God, the joy of the Lord, the righteousness of the Lord, the peace of the Lord. Don't look upon the things of another. Mind your own garden. Tend your own garden. Let those that have a nicer looking garden than you answer to their garden. Because God wants to bless you. He will bless you. You will prosper. You will be able to help another if you tend your own. Like I said, if you produce one cob of corn with 800 seeds, the potential within that 800 seeds you can't even think about it, but it's there. And he's not going to curse the ground, right? He's not going to curse the ground if you're tending it. If you're going to toil in it, it'll curse, and it'll be cursed, and it'll stay cursed, and you'll end up with a half cob. Let's pray. Lord, tonight, I just pray, Lord, that the serpent's not here whispering in people's ears because that's what he's doing today. He's blinding us to the truth of your word, Lord, because we don't take time to read it for ourselves. We rely on what is said of another. We have moments of doubt. We look upon the things that are pleasant to the eye and good, but in and of themselves, they are actually evil and will end up actually destroying us. If we do not do well, it says that sin is lying at the door. But we know who has the key to death, hell, and the grave. We know, Lord, that you hold all things in your hand. 
that you direct all things, that all things move and have their being, have their existence in you, all things. And that, Lord, you didn't put us here to put us through trials. You didn't put us here to live on the edge and just get the barely saved award. No, you put us here, Lord, so that we could come boldly to your throne of grace, so that we could live boldly in this world. We are not of this world. The things of this world are not we str- what we strive after. You give us those things, Lord, so that we can use them to further the kingdom. There are places that Pastor Shirley and Pastor Mark can go that I would never gain entrance. There are people that they will see and meet that I would never have opportunity to meet. Lord, you place people at different places within the kingdom, not so that we can lord over one another, but so that we can complement one another. There are people in this room from every walk of life. We all have needs, but those needs are the same to some degree. We need food, we need water, we need clothing, we need fellowship, we need friendship, all of that, yeah, but there are other things, Lord, that people have lived, like my friend Henry. My friend Henry, who, who I mean, he, he looks at the markings on his skin and says, man, that's where I was, but that's not where God has me now. I live a life of peace, of joy, righteousness in the Holy Spirit. That's where we need to be. You're here tonight because you can meet the need of someone who's here that I can't meet. You're here tonight because you are the one, the only one, that someone might even listen to. That's why we come together Rejoice in him and see his salvation spring forth. We bless you, Lord, for this time. I thank you for the opportunity. I just pray, Lord, that you'll toss the bones out, let the meat stand. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. I think we have an offering. Brother, come on down. I'll let you. It in. Check, check. Yep. It's working. That means write your check too. <laughs> <laughs> in obedience, let's uh, declare this together. As I give to God, the first fruits of my income, he will bless me with abundance. I receive his promise by faith, and I will offer him the first fruits of all I have. I will not allow fear to take root in my life. I refuse to limit God. God will multiply my handful of flour and oil. He will provide for all of my needs. In Jesus' name, amen. it is. Uh, if you need prayer, I'll be up here. Um, if uh, you'd like to even just, just talk about what I said, maybe. Uh, if I hurt your feelings, I, that was not the intent. Um, but I'll be here, and you can come and chastise me if you want. That's okay, too. Um, also, uh, I think we have pizza tonight. And, uh, boy, I got I to gotta say... Uh, Sometimes I wish I was out there with the kids. I saw them last week out in the parking lot with the water balloons and stuff. <laughs> Thinking, yeah, I'd probably die out there. But <laughs> anyway, thanks again for being here tonight. God bless you. And um, if you don't know Jesus, today is the day of salvation. If you do know Jesus, today is the day of salvation.
period. You can't live on what you did yesterday, and you can't look into tomorrow. Today is the day. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Have a good week, guys. See you Sunday. Yes, see you Sunday. See you Sunday. Yes, see you Sunday. <laughs> <laughs>